several weeks going through biblical examples. And so we're going to do that uh, for one more, maybe it's going to be two more, at least, uh, I think, of lessons of biblical examples. Uh, one of those is going to be right now, we're going to look at biblical examples this morning, and then I'm going to finish up this lesson tonight for the evening service. So we'll hear the first part, uh, leave you with a cliffhanger, and then you got to come back tonight in order to get the, to, to get the rest of it. Uh, we're going to finish up uh, biblical examples and uh, move on next week to uh, some application. Um, so this morning, we're going to look at a human government, again, in the Bible, and I was thinking of this as an ending. Uh, Pastor Marcos and I were actually talking about this in Guatemala last week. I uh, was thinking about this as an ending. We sort of can't end our consideration of examples of Christian resistance and civil authority on the earth without looking at satanically inspired civil authority on the earth, satanically charged civil authority on the earth. So we're going to do that this morning. Uh, look at human governments, world governments, and we're going to be, begin that in Daniel, the book of Daniel, looking at Daniel chapter 7, and then we're going to tie that up by uh, comparing Daniel with Revelation, in particular Revelation 13. So I'd like to conclude our discussion then of biblical examples with reference to uh, what we're calling satanic counterfeits. Satanic counterfeits. Often when the Lord institutes something good, uh, a type, a good type that points to a glorious fulfillment, points to something that is fulfilled in Jesus Christ, Satan comes along and introduces a counterfeit. Satan introduces his godless anti-type. Um, for example, God's institution of marriage, right? pointing to the relationship of Jesus Christ to his bride, the church. And then through the deception of the serpent, we see the fall of man leading to adultery, homosexuality, even homosexual mirage, which is uh, Satan's uh, deceptive counter counterfeit. Uh, the institution of civil authority is the same. No exception to that pattern. God institutes and appoints civil authority to be a minister of God for good, pointing forward ultimately, ultimately to the one who will rule in righteousness in an everlasting kingdom. Uh, Satan brings about an ungodly counterfeit, <clears throat> foreshadowed in the kingdoms of men, pointing forward ultimately to the worship of the beast, as we'll see, and what is blasphemy against God. And so Romans 13, to tie this back to Romans 13, Romans 13 <clears throat> represents a government, if you will, uh, and our relationship to government that is intended by God. It's a, an ideal, if you will, that is prescribed by God. It describes the way in which government should work. In the, it describes the way in which civil authority should work. And it commands Christians to submit to that government that works in that way. To the, de to the degree that that civil authority uh, represents the interests of Satan <laughs> and not God is the degree, uh, to the degree that Christians must resist that civil authority. Um, governments are... Uh, accountable, to be accountable to God. We know that from Romans 13. Governments exercising their delegated authority um, should be in harmony with the ordinance of God. They are to be an, an avenger to execute wrath on those who practice evil. They are to be a terror to evil works. They are to be God's minister for good. <clears throat> what happens then when governments are no longer God's ministers for good, but rather Satan's ministers for evil? Uh, not a Romans 13 government, but a Revelation 13 government. What happens when these governments become Satan's uh, counterfeits? There is a spectrum, if you will. To the degree that government represents the will of God for civil authority, on one end of the spectrum, Romans 13, on the other end of the spectrum is Revelation 13 and the Satanic counterfeit proffered by the enemies of God. Um, and along that spectrum, Christians have to determine um, when it is right and when it is responsible, when it is faithfulness to God to resist. Satan uses a counterfeit authority and wields a counterfeit authority with satanic or godless governments. It is to these authorities, these satanic counterfeits, that Christians ultimately must not submit. So to begin our discussion this morning, we want to go to Daniel chapter 7 and consider together this godless, satanically inspired counterfeit of civil authority. Now, if you've um, read your Bible through, if you've read through the book of Daniel, uh, remember that preceding Daniel's vision in Daniel chapter 7, Daniel's vision of 
godless human governments in history comes the godless human worldwide government in Daniel's own day. Um, who was in rule when Daniel was alive? Who was ruling and reigning? Nebuchadnezzar in the kingdom of Babylon. It's fascinating to me that the whore in Revelation 13, the Revelation 17, Revelation 19 is referred to as Babylon, right? Babylon. Uh, we're going to see some connections there as we go through this. Um, Nebuchadnezzar is a beast of a king. <laughs> He's a beast of a king. He, uh, he has um, a God-given vision preceding this uh, vision, Daniel's vision in Daniel chapter 7. Nebuchadnezzar in chapter 2 has a God-given vision of human kingdoms that occupy the planet before the end. Um, in his vision, in Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar's vision, his own kingdom uh, was represented by a head, a giant statue, with a head of gold. Nebuchadnezzar was that head of gold. All of those kingdoms represented by the statue in Nebuchadnezzar's vision were destroyed by a, a stone, a small stone that becomes a mountain that covers the whole earth. If you remember our study of Daniel. And so what does Nebuchadnezzar do then in response to that vision? His own kingdom represented by the head another kingdom represented by the torso, another kingdom represented by the legs. Um, Nebuchadnezzar then responds by making a full statue himself entirely in gold. <laughs> in other words, Nebuchadnezzar in his pride, I'll never be cast down or thwarted. My kingdom will be the greatest kingdom on the earth. Uh, and he commands that all people in the kingdom should worship, bow down to that gold statue. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, if you remember the story, they refuse sends Nebuchadnezzar, this godless tyrant, uh, into a rage, and he throws them into the furnace of fire. Satanic counterfeit, right? Uh, the beast doesn't get the worship that he feels entitled to, and he uh, plans to burn Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fire. <clears throat> he is made to be then a literal beast <laughs> in Daniel chapter 4, uh, sent out, um, has... Um, grows hair like eagle's feathers and fingernails like bird's claws, eats the grass of the field, becomes a literal beast in Daniel chapter 4. He loses the kingdom, loses Babylon in Daniel chapter 5, and he's supplanted by Darius the Mede of the Medo-Persian Empire, the Medes and the Persians. Um, and then uh, he receives the kingdom in Daniel chapter 6. Darius the Mede, following in the same pattern of godless human governments, he forbids then the worship of any other gods. Um, they're not allowed to make supplication to any other gods, but to Darius himself. So he forbids the worship of any other gods. You remember the story that Daniel refuses that, uh, continues to pray to the one true and living God of Israel. And Daniel then is thrown to the lions. In one case, Nebuchadnezzar um, commanding that which God forbids in the very next case with Darius the Mede, Darius forbidding that which God commands. And in both cases, uh, we see, if you remember those accounts in the book of Daniel, um, a theology, if you will, of Christian resistance. What do these satanic, worldly, counterfeit governments do? They command the worship of other gods. They forbid the worship of the one true and living God. And both these men find out that God is the one who rules in the kingdoms of men and gives them to whomever he wills. His dominion is an everlasting dominion. His kingdom is from generation to generation, right? It's then, after this table setting, if you will, in this context, that Daniel has his vision of four great beasts in Daniel chapter 7. These four great beasts, each beast represents a worldwide government. If you conceive of the governments at this time, they're over the known world. A Nebuchadnezzar had conquered the known world at that time. Um, when the Medo-Persians, when the Persians in particular came through, they conquered the known world at that time. Greece conquered the no known world at that time. Rome conquered the, the known world at that time. Um, from Rome then, the kingdom of Rome is splintered. And what we see then is not an empire per se <clears throat> that has conquered the whole world, but a system that has conquered the whole world. We'll talk about that when we get there. So these four great beasts in Daniel chapter 7, each beast representing a worldwide government. So remember the context with me. Daniel has come to understand from reading the scroll of Isaiah <clears throat> that the 70 years of Babylonian captivity is over. 
70 years of the captivity is over. Daniel chapter 9 uh, explains that. He believes, Daniel believes, that the 70 years of captivity being over, God is going to institute his kingdom. Uh, Daniel, I think, hopes that that will be a kingdom of righteousness under the rule of God's promised Messiah. That kingdom uh, will be established. God comes to Daniel then through the angel and explains in visions to Daniel that it's not going to be the establishment of God's kingdom after the 70-year captivity, but after a period of 70 weeks of years. Uh, You've heard the Lord use the example of uh, 70 times 7 with respect to forgiveness, right? This is not 70 years, it's 70 times 7 years. In other words, a very long time. It's going to be a long time uh, before the end will come and before the kingdom is established. It'll be 70 weeks of years to Daniel. So um, you could also connect that to the, I think, the sevenfold punishment. If you remember that from Leviticus chapter 26, I will punish you seven times more for your sins. What we see here is um, a seven time, a 70 times seven punishment, if you will, a 70 times seven exile for sin um, before the kingdom of righteousness is established. Uh, and to Daniel, uh, the Lord explains that this is what will happen before the end of time. So Daniel's vision, Daniel chapter 7, explains human governments and what will happen with respect to human government before the end comes. Now I want us to think through this. I want to look at Daniel chapter 7. We're going to go through that. And as we go through, I want you to think and make material observations with respect to our theology of public life, right? Material observations uh, with respect to civil authority and uh, theology of Christian resistance, right? So turn to Daniel chapter 7 with me. Daniel chapter 7 verse 1, it's the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon. Daniel has a dream and visions of his head while on his bed. Then he wrote down the dream telling the main facts, verse 2. Daniel spoke saying, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea, and four great beasts came up from the sea, each different from the other. This is a vision, and we're going to find out this is a vision of the end, or history that is leading up to the end, okay? And it's amazing. If you want to do a study of Daniel, I highly recommend it. We went through Daniel as a church a while back. It was absolutely a wonderful study. But you get into Daniel 7, 8, 9, in particular, Daniel uh, 10 and 11, and the specificity with which these things are prophesied before the events actually took place is astonishing. God knows the future, and so you see the future laid out in technicolor specificity before these events came to pass. This is a book that is written by God, not by men, right? Uh, It is a great study, and I encourage you to do it, okay? Uh, The first beast, verse 4, was like a lion. What was the, um, the symbol of the Babylonian Empire? The lion, okay? It had eagle's wings. I watched till its wings were plucked off, <laughs> and it was lifted up from the earth and made to stand on two feet like a man, and a man's heart was given to it. Lion was the symbol of Babylon, chapter 4, verse 33. Nebuchadnezzar grew hair like eagle's feathers. He grew nails like bird's claws, right? This first beast is speaking of the Babylonian Empire, Verse 5, suddenly another beast, a second like a bear. It was raised up on one side, had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. And they said thus to it, arise, devour much flesh. Verse 6, after this I looked and there was another beast like a leopard, which had on its back four wings of a bird. This beast also had four heads and dominion was given to it. Right off the bat, we're talking about here too, apocalyptic an apocalyptic genre, an apocalyptic vision. Uh, So what we're talking about, we're seeing a lot of symbolism, right? There's a lot of symbolism involved with apocalyptic literature. We're going to see that symbolism again in Revelation. Now, we're not, you know, going by the seat of our pants here to determine what these beasts represent. We're actually told in Daniel chapter 8 what two of these beasts represent. We can certainly um, tell from the fourth what the fourth represents, right? So we're, we're told what the symbols mean, okay? Um, these beasts are described like the beasts of Daniel's next vision in chapter 8. If you want, <clears throat> on your own time, if you want to read forward into chapter 8, you'll see two other beasts listed there that are described in similar fashion, okay? Uh, Medo-Persia and Greece. Verse 7, after this, I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, 
dreadful and terrible, exceedingly strong. It had huge iron teeth. It was devouring, breaking in pieces, trampling the residue with its feet. It was different from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. Now, from chapter 7, verse 24, we know the ten horns are ten kings, ten kings representing ten kingdoms. Um, We see that sort of replicated by the multi-part statue from Nebuchadnezzar's vision or dream in Daniel chapter 2. So Daniel, here with his fourth beast now, awed by its strength, awed by its power. Later, this beast, this fourth beast, which is different from all the others, represented by ten kingdoms, if you will, will devour the whole earth, going to trample the residue of the whole earth with its feet. Uh, And we know this fourth kingdom, the fourth kingdom that arises in human history is the empire of Rome. Not just Rome, though. Uh, Rome evaporates, if you will, (laughs) under attack from world powers at the time, other powers at the time. Rome sort of evaporates, and it's replaced by really what becomes a worldwide system of kingdoms. We're going to talk about that in a moment. Uh, This type... Uh, this type of kingdom is going to be seen again. Ten horns referring to po- horns referring to power, horns referring to kings. In this case, many kings, many kingdoms. Verse 8. I was considering the horns then, and there was another horn, a little one, coming up among them, before whom three of the first horns were plucked out by the roots. <clears throat> In other words, this one little horn that arises with power over this empire is as one of the 10 kings who had power over this empire, uh, now is given more power, right? Is given more power. Uh, It's what's represented by the other three horns being plucked up by the roots. He assumes their power as it were. And there, verse eight, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth speaking pompous words. As we consider this, and as we consider the horns, we consider the kings, Think back to Genesis, the creation account, and who was it who was originally, originally given dominion? Man, right? Man was given dominion. Man was given dominion over the beasts, right? God's image bearer, God's vice regent. You can see that in Genesis chapter 1. You can see that in Psalm 8, right? Man given authority, if you will, given dominion over the beasts of the earth. Who in Genesis chapter 3, usurped the dominion of man. The serpent, a beast. (laughs) It's here as though the seed of the serpent, rather than the seed of the woman, is the one taking dominion, or is the one who is ruling, the one who has um, command, if you will, of civil authority on the earth. Beasts... I think one of the reasons that Daniel or the Lord uses beasts in this case is that uh, beasts are a way of showing that this has fallen entirely short of God's intended design. Beasts are not intended to rule. Beasts are not intended to take dominion. What do we see here on the earth? Beasts ruling, right? It's uh, a jab, if you will, I think, (laughs) at um, man's depravity, at man falling woefully short of God's intended design for civil authority. We have beasts ruling. Now, the fourth beast is in power until, verse 9, Daniel watched and thrones were put in place. These beasts ruled until the Ancient of Days was seated. His garment was white as snow. The hair of his head was like pure wool. His throne was a fiery flame, its wheels a burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him, Thousand, a thousand thousands ministered to him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court was seated. The books were open. When it mentions there the court, the court's uh, seated. The court was seated. The books were open. It's um, a reference to judgment. It doesn't sound like uh, Revelation chapter twenty, right, where the books were open. Court is in session. What is this? This is judgment day. Uh, this is judgment day. And so this fourth beast then that is unlike the other beasts, represented not by one kingdom, but by many kingdoms. This world system that has come into place now, eventually with one horn taking more power than the others, 
uh, speaking pompous words leading to blasphemy against God, ruling as a satanic counterfeit on the earth, this particular beast lasts until judgment. It lasts, this kingdom continues until the ancient of days comes, until the court is seated, and until the books were opened. We can see that in Revelation chapter 20 with the great white throne, right? Uh, the judgment of all the earth. So then in verse 14, Daniel summarizes. I want you to follow along with me now. Daniel summarizes verse 11. I watched then because of the sound of the pompous words which the horn was speaking. I watched till the beast was slain, its body destroyed and given to the burning flame. If you read Revelation, uh, you see an account of that taking place in Revelation too, don't you? We're going to find out when we get to Revelation 13, Revelation is interpreting or explaining, reiterating Daniel's vision from Daniel chapter 7, Daniel chapter 8, 9, 10, 11, okay? Um, Verse 12, as for the rest of the beasts, they had their dominion taken away. Who does Daniel mean by the rest of the beasts? Those that he just described, right, in verses 1 through 7. So those first three beasts, the rest of the beasts had their dominion taken away, Yet their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. They had their time on the pages of history uh, before their dominion was ultimately taken away. And this fourth beast then replaces them. Daniel finishes up verse 13. I was watching in the night visions and behold, one like the son of man coming with the clouds of heaven. You can see this referring to the end of time, right? The second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. He came to the ancient of days. They brought him near before him. Then to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom. Then all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away. And his kingdom, the one which shall not be destroyed. These beasts of the earth, these satanic counterfeits, these usurpers, of God's delegated civil authority will all pass away, will all pass away. They'll be replaced ultimately by the one kingdom which shall not, be, which shall not pass away, uh, that kingdom which shall not be destroyed. After this vision then, after this dream, Daniel seeks an explanation. Look at verse 15. I, Daniel, was grieved in my spirit, within my body, and the visions of my head troubled me. I came near to the one who, one of those who stood by and asked him the truth of all this. So he told me and made known to me the interpretation of these things. Those great beasts, which are four, are four kings which arise out of the earth. But the saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever and even forever and ever. What does that mean? That means forever. (laughs) Uh, Into the ages, into eternity, okay? These four beasts, three of them representing actual kingdoms that arose on the earth, the fourth beast representing Rome, that actually, a kingdom that actually rose on the earth, and then continuing past Rome to what has become a a worldwide system, if you will, that has covered the whole earth, trampling the whole earth under its feet, lasts until the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and the ushering in of the everlasting kingdom, which will be ruled by the king of righteousness, possessed by the saints of the Most High, right, until that kingdom enters in forever. So what we see then in Daniel's, we see from Daniel's time in the kingdom of Babylon under Nebuchadnezzar, until the end of time in the everlasting kingdom. This is a history, if you will, of the earth, okay? So he said, then I wish to know, verse 19, I wish to know the truth about the fourth beast. That fourth beast is an interesting one, right? He was different from all the others, exceedingly dreadful, with his teeth of iron, its nails of bronze, which devoured broken pieces, trampled the residue with its feet, Ten horns that were on its head, the other horn which came up before which uh, three fell, namely that horn which had eyes, eyes signifying um, wisdom, uh, discernment, being able to see what's going on, a mouth which spoke pompous words. When Daniel mentions here in Daniel chapter 7, the mouth of this horn that speaks pompous words, if you, again, if you've read your Bible, what does that remind you of? The Antichrist, right? The one who speaks pompous words, speaks blasphemies, okay? This one had a mouth which spoke pompous words, whose appearance 
was greater than his fellows. I was watching verse 21, and the same horn was making war against the saints and prevailing against them. When you study eschatology, you know we, we did an eschatology uh, study in our church a while back, many moving parts. Um, when we look at Daniel chapter 7, you've got to remember these things, right? Remember these things. And when you look at other passages, like we're going to in a moment, when we go to Daniel chapter 9, when we look at Revelation 13, uh, these images are going to come back uh, and they're going to fit into um, what you'll understand of the last days as we coordinate them with uh, other texts, right? So this same horn making war against the saints, prevailing against them until, verse 22, the ancient of days came. And a judgment was made in favor of the saints of the Most High, and the time came for the saints to possess the kingdom. Has that time come yet? Not yet, right? So we're still we're talking about future events here. In other words, this fourth kingdom that began with Rome is the one that is in place over the whole earth when the end comes and the saints receive the everlasting kingdom. There are some, we'll see again in a moment, there are some who, in particular, uh, dispensational premillennialists that are looking for a final end times one world government, right? There's going to be a, a confederacy of 10 countries, or a, they're looking at the European Union, how many are in there? Is there 10 yet, right? Or that there's going to be this, this confederacy of 10 kings over the whole earth, or one world government ruled by one world ruler, it's not what Daniel's talking about here. That's not what Revelation means, right? Um, right now, this very system is alive and well in our day. We live under the fourth beast now, right? This kingdom was ushered in uh, during the Roman Empire, and since the fall of the Roman Empire has continued over the whole earth, and when we get to uh, the destruction of Babylon the Great, uh, the whore Babylon that is destroyed, cast down. It's a casting down of this very world system that we're currently living under, okay? We'll see that more clearly as we get to Revelation 13. Verse 23, thus he said, the fourth, fourth beast shall be a fourth kingdom on earth, which shall be different from all other kingdoms, and shall devour the whole earth, trample it, and break it in pieces. This would comport with Rome as the type not necessarily a one world government, but a system that is over all the earth. That system becomes the anti-type, if you will. Uh, in fact, it's not a one world single government because, verse 24, the ten horns are ten kings. A multiplicity of kingdoms that arise out of this one beast, this one um, empire, the Roman Empire. Uh, ten kings who shall arise from this kingdom. It's succeeded by kingdoms that arise out of it, right? The power of Rome, um, when Rome fell, was divided. It was divided among various rulers, um, not really replaced, but um, broken up, if you will. And not by 10 kings, but by multiple, multiple kings. There's been all kinds of efforts to make that fit 10 kings, but really no way to, to historically do that. Uh, the kingdom of uh, the empire of Rome was broken up by various rulers uh, all over the known world at that time. That theme, that theme is then picked up in Revelation 3, 13. And if you remember Revelation 13, we'll look at it in a moment, that beast that rises out of the sea. How many horns does that beast rising out of the sea have in Revelation 13? 10 horns, <laughs> 10 horns. Uh, later in Revelation 17, uh, the woman who rides the scarlet beast, how many horns does that scarlet beast have? Ten horns, right? Ten horns. We're talking about the same system. Uh, we're talking about the same beast, okay? And Revelation 13, Revelation 17, for example, um, interpreting for us, explaining for us Daniel chapter 7. So um, later in Revelation 17, that beast ridden by the harlot woman whose name is Babylon, Okay. After the, uh, verse 24, 10 kings who shall arise from this kingdom, uh, another shall ri arise after them. He shall be different from the first ones, and he shall subdue three kings. He's going to have a third more power, if you will. Verse 25, he shall speak pompous words against the Most High, shall persecute the saints of the Most High, and shall intend to change times and law. Now think with me again. I, I want to ask you in a moment, 
um, characteristics of civil authority that has become tyrannical, <laughs> and when it's right for Christians to consider resistance, uh, remember these words, okay? The saints shall be given into his hand for a time and times and half a time. That phrase is unique to Daniel. It'll be repeated again in Revelation. Um, and what we could, you know, surmise that to mean initially, initially is three and a half years, a time, times, half a time. It's going to be uh, portrayed in Daniel as um, uh, 42 months, 1260 days. It's all referring to the same time period, times, time, and half a time. Verse 26, but the court shall be seated. Daniel's repeating this, this view of history, right? They shall take away his dominion to consume and destroy it forever. This beast is going to be ca cast down. Uh, we find that this beast will be cast into the lake of fire. His dominion is taken away. Verse 27, then the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints most high. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and all dominions shall serve and obey him. This, verse 28, is the end of the account. As for me, Daniel, my thoughts greatly troubled me and my countenance changed, but I kept the matter in my heart. And again, these are actual kingdoms. You can look at that in uh, Daniel chapter 8. Okay, think with me now, covering Daniel chapter 7. Give me some characteristics, if you will, of satanic counterfeit civil authority. Give me some characteristics of these usurper worldly, godless kingdoms that are not acting in accord or in harmony with God's ordinance, but acting against it. What characterizes these kingdoms? What characterizes this counterfeit civil authority? Miss Leah. Oh, got somebody over. And we'll come back to Miss Leah. <laughs> uh, something that I was observing is uh, like in 21, the same horn was making war against the saints. Mm. A judge, um, and then even later, 25, then the saints shall be given into his hands. So there's this uh, almost peculiar persecution of saints or of the people of God. Yeah, amen, amen. That word persecution from Daniel 7, um, the word literally means uh, to wear out like a garment. So in other words, the saints of the Most High are worn down by persecution, worn down by the, the civil authority. They are, um, it, it, it would suggest a prolonged period of persecution, uh, not incidents of persecution, but a long period of persecution where the saints are literally worn down, uh, worn out like a garment. Yeah, very good. Someone else? Yes, Tanya. Very good. Yeah, everything God says he's going to be against. He is actively opposed to God. He speaks against God. He speaks blasphemies. He is uh, calling for the, the saints to speak against God, calling for people to oppose God. Yeah, stands in direct opposition to God. So not in harmony. He's not God's minister for good, Romans 13. That's not who we're describing here. Uh, he's not God's avenger executing wrath on him who does evil. He's supporting and promoting evil. <laughs> so this is not God's minister, Romans 13. This is Satan's minister, Revelation 13. Right? Someone else? Yeah. Yes, Thinking yeah. about uh, uh, Islam and how the Christians right now at this time are being persecuted um, uh, with their religion, you know. Um, yeah, very good. Yeah, you know that... Um, yeah, this particular, this fourth kingdom that continues even into our day, um, Christians are being persecuted even today for their worship of the Lamb. Uh, this usurper, satanic counterfeit, uh, wants to do away with the worship of God. Uh, and at one point, we'll see, um, he'll stand in the most holy place and will put an end to worship. Um, so that, yeah, that's a good point. Someone else? Yeah, Nico. So another observation I was um, seeing was in 25, uh, the last one on there, um, where he'll, let's see, he'll make alterations in times and in law. Yeah. I'm kind of just thinking of like radical things, um, like things that, you know, for the past 2,000 years or whatnot, marriage has been between a man and a woman, and now they're making mirage. It's literally just the most 
it just it just doesn't make sense. It's like yeah. putting a, a square peg in a circle hole. Yeah. And it's like there's that, and there's people like um, there's more than this idea, a false idea of more than two genders. It's like they're making um, <laughs> alterations in times in law. I mean, I'm sure there's there's examples like making abortion legal. Yeah. Um, I mean, I don't absolutely. Know. Yeah. So there's yeah, that was just something you know, making alterations in time and law, like radical changes to things that are kind of basic and fundamental in society. Yeah, very, very good, very good. And that's exactly what's going on. Yeah, to, to the to the um, for example, to Daniel in his context, to make a change to times would have been to um, change the Jewish calendar. It would have been to uh, do away with the feast days, for example, uh, to do away with those festivals, uh, to stop the pilgrimages. And of course, they were in exile, so those things were stopped, right? Um, to change law was literally to undermine God's law. Um, and we see that happening, to your point, all over the place today, uh, undermining God's law. Tom. Good morning, brother. Good morning. Um, how should we reconcile the ten kings, ten kingdoms and the ten kings? In yeah. Daniel 7 and uh, also in the book of Revelation, because yeah. these are specific. They're not, they're not just yeah. a multitude. Um, he, he, he quotes it a number of times, and John yeah. quotes it a number of times. Yeah. Ten. We'll talk about when we get to Revelation 13. I'll cover that with us. Yeah, these numbers, um, there's several numbers that are used, and in particular, this one involving um, 1,260 days or times, times, and half a time. We'll see that these numbers are used symbolically. So when we get to Revelation 13, I'll, I'll talk about that. So <laughs> thanks, brother. Ben. I was just noting the pompous words. Yeah. Like just speaking without any regard for God, without any regard yeah. for his sovereignty and, and authority. Very good. Pompous words, blasphemies, right? Blasphemies against God. Um, very good. So we can't, we won't have, to, I don't want to take the time. We're, we're running out of time already. I want to get to keep going. Um, but we can see how these characteristics of satanic counterfeit civil authority um, are in place even in our day, right? Speaking blasphemies against God, undermining the worship of God, calling for people, mocking the true and living God, changing times, changing laws, right? We see how these characteristics of satanic counterfeits are alive and well in the ongoing fourth beast under which we live today, okay? Um, and it's when civil authority acts in those ways that Christians have not only a right, but a responsibility biblically to honor the Lord, to obey Romans 13 by resisting uh, the ungodly rule of the satanic counterfeit. We'll talk about that more. Okay, um, look at Daniel chapter nine. <clears throat> Daniel chapter nine. We're gonna move along. Uh, what is the timing? I want us to make. I want to make that connection with us, and this is going to go to um, answering Tom's question in a minute here too. What is the timing of this last iteration of the fourth beast? The timing of the final representative kingdom uh, that we know began with the Roman Empire and continues until th this day. I want to establish that timing with you from Daniel chapter nine. Look at Daniel chapter nine, verse twenty. Verse 20, now while I was speaking, praying, confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel and presenting my supplication before the Lord my God for the holy mountain of my God, yes, while I was speaking in prayer, the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, reached me about the time of the evening offering. He informed me and talked with me and said, O Daniel, I have now come forth to give you skill to understand. At the beginning of your supplications, the command went out, and I have come to tell you, for you are greatly beloved. Before Daniel could even finish praying, uh, Gabriel had already been dispatched, right? Therefore, consider the matter and understand the vision. Not 70 years, Daniel, verse 24, but 70 weeks. We know from the context that 70 weeks of years. 70 weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city. Not 70, but 70 times 7, if you will. And that is to accomplish six things, verse 24, to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, in other words, to finish it out, and to anoint the most holy, the most holy place. Um, these six things represent bringing to a consummated conclusion all of redemptive history, right? This is going to usher us into the end. 
70 weeks determined, 70 weeks of years determined for all of redemptive history. Verse 25, know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem, Nehemiah chapter 4 through 6, until Messiah, that's not a good uh, rendering in the New King James. It's not Messiah the Prince, it's literally until Messiah, okay? Until Messiah, there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. During the seven weeks, verse 25, the street shall be built again and the wall even in troublesome times, that short period of time, they established the walls in Jerusalem. They laid the foundation of the new temple. Uh, Nehemiah chapter 4 through 6, verse 26. And after the 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off. What is that a reference to? When was Messiah cut off? The crucifixion, right? The cross. After 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, not for himself, for his people, <laughs> And the people of the prince, literally leader who is to come, shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. That's important to, I think, understand this rightly. It's the people of the prince who is to come, the people of the leader who is to come, who destroy the city and the sanctuary. Um, some would interpret that to mean the Jews, but was it the Jews who destroyed the sanctuary and the city? No. Who was it that destroyed the sanctuary and the city in AD 70? The Romans. So the people of the leader who is to come. Uh, we would uh, see this as an allusion to the Roman Empire, in particular Titus, AD 70, destroying Jerusalem, raising the temple to the ground, destroying the sanctuary. The end of it shall be with a flood, happens quickly. Till the end of the war, desolations are determined. Literally, um, till the end, there shall be war. Till the end, there shall be war. That happened under AD 70, under Emperor Titus. We're still experiencing war today. Titus was another little horn, a representative little horn, if you will. Verse 27, then he, who does the he refer to? The nearest antecedent is that leader. Uh, the people of the leader who is to come. He, the leader, shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. That one week is Daniel's 70th week. The 70th week that began, if you will, after the 69 weeks, began at the crucifixion, okay? Shall confirm a covenant with many for one week, but in the middle of the week, in other words, after times, time, and half a time, in the middle of that 70th week, he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering, and on the wing of abominations shall be one who makes desolate. Literally, on the wing of abominations, the desolating man. On the wing of abominations, the desolating man. Okay, two interpretations of this. We went through this with uh, Daniel. One is the messianic interpretation. And the one who in verse 27 shall confirm a covenant with many for one week is Jesus Christ. Confirming the new covenant for a period of one week. The problem is the chronology. In the middle of the week, he brings an end to sacrifice and offering. Well, those who hold to a messianic interpretation, how does Jesus Christ bring an end to sacrifice and offering? Brings an end by the sacrifice of himself. The problem is the chronology of that statement. It doesn't happen in the middle of the week. It's at the end of 69 weeks that Jesus Christ is cut off. Messiah is cut off. The 70th week then would start after the crucifixion. So that covenant confirmed at the cross, if you will, is not in the middle of the week. Now that would have taken place at the beginning of the week. The chronology is off, right? So we wouldn't take a messianic interpretation of Daniel chapter 9. Who is the he, the prince of the people who is to come? That's referring to this usurping civil authority. Um, the he that shall confirm the covenant with many for one week is that he that is in the world who speaks pompous words. I would submit to you that the he that confirms a covenant with many for one week is that one that represents the beast. Uh, the, the Antichrist, the spirit of Antichrist already in the world. John has said many Antichrists have come already. The spirit of Antichrist already in the world. I would submit to you that he is the one who uh, confirms a covenant, if you will, a counterfeit covenant against the Lord and against his anointed with many for one week in the middle of the week. In other words, after 1260 days, after times, time, and half a time, he brings an end to sacrifice and offering. Well, what do we see in 2 Thessalonians? Well, what do we see in Revelation? We see this little horn, this pompous horn, standing in the most holy place, 
putting an end to sacrifice and offering, putting an end to the worship of God, okay? And on the wing of abominations shall be the desolating man. Uh, this is, I think, referring to the same person, verse 27, the Antichrist, okay? And again, the chronology lines up there. It's um, during Daniel's 70th week. In particular, this covenant struck in the middle of the week. Um, and um, if you go to uh, Matthew 24, we'll finish with this. When the Antichrist comes, this final iteration of the Antichrist that is already in the world, um, when he comes... He comes in the middle of Daniel's 70th week. If you follow the chronology of Matthew 24, a time of tribulation. And then the Lord Jesus Christ says in verse 15, Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel, the prophet standing in the holy place, this desolating man, when you see him standing in the holy place, most holy place, whoever reads, let him understand then those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let him who is on the housetop go down. Do not take anything out of his house. Let him who is in the field not go back to get his clothes. But woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies in those days. Pray that your flight may not be in winter or on the Sabbath. For then there will be great tribulation, such has not been seen since the beginning of the world until this time. No, nor ever shall be. And unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. What does this desolating man do? He blasphemes God. He puts an end to sacrifice. and he, he puts an end to worship, if you will. Outlaws worship, if you will. He stands in the most holy place and blasphemes. Um, and that's at the middle, the middle of Daniel's 70th week. It lines up perfectly well with the chronology of Daniel chapter 9. Okay? So if you look at Daniel chapter 9 in com combination with Matthew 24, the fourth beast... Um, if you will, reigns and rules this satanic counterfeit, this satanic civil authority until the time when the Son of Man comes. After, that tri after the tribulation of those days, Matthew 24, immediately after the tribulation of those days, you'll see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven. All right, so think with me. And what we want to do tonight then, we're going to wrap up and uh, we're going to finish tonight, is we're going to take uh, Daniel chapter 7, Daniel chapter 9, and we're going to go now to the book of Revelation and see how Revelation, in particular Revelation chapter 12, Revelation chapter 13, uh, portrays life, if you will, under this fourth beast. Uh, and we'll see how history wraps up um, with this civil authority. We've got to go, but any questions, let me know. And we'll, we'll answer a lot of your questions tonight. You're going to have to come back to get answers. All right, all right let's pray. Uh, Father in heaven, Lord, thank you um, for condescending in grace and mercy to us to reveal these things to us through your word. Uh, they're so comforting for your people, Lord. You've told us beforehand what will take place so that when it comes uh, with the disciples of uh, the Lord's day in the first century to disciples of our day, uh, we can take comfort knowing that you have ordained these things to come to pass, that you are sovereign over them. You care for us so we can cast our cares upon you and we can trust you uh, with all of this uh, until you finally come in your glory uh, to receive the kingdom. We're grateful, Lord, for the opportunity to think about these things. Help us to think about them rightly, faithfully, um, so that we know how we are to view civil authority in our own day and how uh, we might, to honor you, uh, have a robust biblical theology of public life, of Christian resistance. We might honor you in our relation to civil authority. We love you, Lord. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.